Over 25 years of international business and negotiation experience under his belt. He worked as a business owner, consultant, and also educator, and brought him into contact with a lot of top businesses, organizations, and learning institutions around the world. He has done business and negotiation in more than 50 countries, including Asia, Europe, Middle East, South America, and Africa. To name a few big names, Bay Area company that he has been working with, he worked with Genentech, Wells Fargo, Chevron, Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Lab, and Samsung as well. He is selected as a UC Berkeley Extension Honored Instructor in 2004, and he teaches various programs in UC Extension, including business negotiation and international business strategy. So uh, I'd like to welcome Ernst Hurt. And his topic today is Chinese-American negotiation styles, a comparison. Aaron's. Thank you, Alan. Can you all hear me? Um, I just got back from China. I actually was over there for about three weeks, uh, coupled with a trip to, to Sri Lanka to see my son get married, my big opportunity to ride on an elephant and wear a sarong. And uh, I uh, continue to be amazed by the differences in the process of how people communicate and how businesses are focused more and more on the content of doing deals and negotiation and often tend to neglect the process of the negotiation. So this talk this morning, uh, a brief talk and a question and answer period, will deal with the processes involved uh, as as understood by me, an American-born American, in doing business with the, uh, the Chinese. Um, uh, I've never been on the Google campus before. I was flying back, uh, as I say, on the plane the other day, and I uh, opened up Forbes magazine and saw an article on Google, which I believe is your, uh, uh, how we would pronounce Google, the Chinese subsidiary. And uh, I think that, the issue of growing a business, of penetrating a market, uh, obviously involves a lot of negotiation. And if you're well prepared to, uh, uh, to do that, uh, then I think that it will behoove you and it will behoove uh, your company, Google. Uh, companies over here tend not to be so concerned with the process of how negotiations are done overseas. And I think that is to their disadvantage. Most of the companies that contact us tend to be foreign companies wanting to understand how Americans negotiate. So let's flip the table on them here and see if we can at least understand some of the, uh, the, the pitfalls that uh, might uh, 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 trip you up. The um, uh, study of negotiating with the Chinese is, is, is really fairly recent. I mean, there, there's a classic study by a guy named Lucian Pai back in 1982, but fundamentally there hasn't been a lot written on it. Uh, the library is full of a lot of texts and, and, and dissertations on negotiating with the Japanese. Um, Harvard in 2003 in the Harvard Business Review of October um, had an article on negotiating with the Chinese, and we'll talk about a couple of those points as we um, move through this discussion. Uh, people negotiate, um, if, if, for lack of a better expression, it's almost, it's in their DNA. It's, it's the way they're raised, it's their culture. And what we need to, to understand about um, any culture is what, what what has programmed them? The, the economic philosophies of uh, the country, a country like China, the, uh, the political philosophies, the changes that are occurring in China. Um, most of you, uh, have you been to China recently? A few of you, quite a few of you. Um, I was, uh, I'm just amazed. I was there two years ago. I went back to Shanghai and I don't even recognize it. Yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, um, there was an article that um, population shifts equivalent to the population of Manhattan move to the major cities of China each year. Um, the, the, the change under, uh, that Shanghai is undergoing is, is huge. And um, it's a mixture of, uh, well, anybody who says it's communist is, 
is, is foolish if you're defining it in terms of the old communist system. But there are definitely uh, uh, impacts on the people related to the old Confucian system, related to the, uh, the, uh, the communist system, and related to how they, um, how they operate their, um, their cities today. Education, um, uh, the emphasis on understanding how, how we negotiate the accessibility of education to people, um, increasing dramatically in China. Uh, cultures affected by language and religion, and of course the, the societal structures. So all of these things come to bear when we look at a country. And what we need to understand is, is, is best described by sort of a concentric circle. Um, a culture starts out with core values, and those values tend to form uh, an outer ring called norms. And the norms are how society sets up sort of understood rules of behavior. And those norms, which affect behavior, then are what we come in contact with, this outer ring, behavior. Now, what occurs when you, as an American, go over to China is that that outer ring of behavior that we've been programmed with intersects with the outer ring of behavior that the Chinese have been uh, programmed with or any culture, and that overlap is where we can have a high degree of um, confusion. Uh, let's talk specifically about China and see if I can give you some examples. One quarter of the world's population, approximately, 1.5 billion people, 1.5 billion potential customers. Rapid economic growth, opening up more and more uh, to, to Western markets, yet still doing business in the Chinese way, not the Western way, and definitely expanding opportunities. Yet, China is very, very different in terms of how they approach um, business negotiations. Uh, let's, let's, let's take an example. If we look at an American, we say to an American, what is a negotiation? Uh, they'll tell you that a negotiation is fundamentally a process to get a deal, to um, uh, uh, build value, hopefully, and to, to sort of codify in a contract or a written or a signed agreement. The word tampan in Chinese does not mean negotiation. In fact, there's no translation directly from Chinese that will come up negotiation. It tends to come up as a discussion, a dialogue. As someone described, it has a beginning, uh, a middle, and um, a seemingly uh, absence of an end. And so one of the things that we need to understand is that the, the goal that we as an American pursue is not necessarily consistent with the goal that the Chinese might pursue. Now, let me pause here one moment. Um, uh, in this discussion, I'm not going to, um, I'm trying to avoid talking in stereotypes, and stereotypes are a big, big problem. However, there are consistent patterns which you need to be aware of, and you need to have your antenna up and, and, and ready for when you're negotiating so that you can be prepared if you're confronted with one of these situations. Um, China's a high context society. By high context, I mean it isn't all verbal. You know, read my, read my lips, but read my face, read my hands, read my actions. Uh, as a high context society, that presents another problem for most American negotiators. We tend to be very low context readers. Um, the best of us tend to be women. And um, uh, it's a problem for negotiating because it isn't always the words, it's the meaning behind the words which become important. Um, going back to the, the American process again of the contract, uh, Americans are looking for a contract the Chinese are probably looking more for a um, relationship. And 
a ongoing business relationship. However, that is not to say that they are obsessed with win-win. In fact, I would say that they're not obsessed with win-win at all. Um, they're definitely looking for the, um, um, the upper hand. Consensus. Consensus is very important to the Chinese. A, ch a Chinese negotiating team is going to come up with one game plan in most cases, and everyone is going to buy into the, uh, uh, the game plan. Um, the individuals on the team must, must embrace it. Uh, one of the tricks I'll talk about at the end, or tips, would be for you to constantly try to couch your negotiations with the Chinese in terms of the societal benefit to the Chinese. Because why is it good, why is it good for them as a group? Um, negotiations by the Chinese are strongly affected by the, the old Confucian system of ethics and morals, of role and of hierarchy. Um, uh, there are definite uh, uh, obligations placed upon the host in a negotiation and obligations placed upon the, the guest or the visitor. You know, Confucius talked about the emperor and how the emperor had to be a, uh, a uh, in order to be a good emperor, had to perform certain functions, had to behave in a certain manner. And he also talked about the subjects and said the subjects as well, in order to be good subjects, have an obligation to to do the role that is, to which they're relegated. In a negotiation, uh, the various members of the team and the hosts and the guests definitely have roles and roles they follow. Uh, loyalty, loyalty is highly valued. Uh, and this can, on occasion, lead to uh, the problem of cronyism, which is something you, you need to be aware of. In other words, it's a very tight linked um, um, group that you're dealing with. The uh, subject of face, Monsi. Now, you've, you've probably, you know, uh, many of you are Asian and many of you, uh, uh, probably all of you have negotiated or, or been with people of Asian extraction and you hear, okay, face, the concept of face. Um, uh, and it's usually don't, don't cause them to lose it. Don't, don't embarrass them. But the interesting thing about face is that face can be earned by you and the increased amount of face that you have as a negotiator with the Chinese is all to your benefit. By the same token, you can give face to someone. And one of the tactics that I uh, advise companies to do is to concentrate on building up the face of the other side in the, in the negotiation. Um, the, um, uh, the repercussions of causing someone to lose face uh, can be extremely dramatic and, and you need to be very aware of the fact that uh, something said which may be seemingly innocuous to you can call, can have really serious impact uh, with, with the other party when, when you're negotiating. So you need to be very, very careful. Um, Quan Shi, the, the idea of connections, the idea that there are relationships. Uh, Quan Shi, the best way to understand Quan Shi is to, to think of a balance sheet. A balance sheet that I encourage you to roughly keep in balance, where doing a favor for someone builds up your side of the balance sheet. So where you can call in an IOU, if you will, later on. One of the tricks often used by skilled Chinese negotiators is to give you favors, is to, is to create situations for you which result in you becoming indebted. And once you're indebted, you may say, okay, I understand what they've done and I'm not going to fall for that. But the reality is that they then expect you to bring the balance sheet back to even again. So you need to be very, very cautious. Um, uh, I guess the watchword would be beware of unsolicited favors when you're negotiating. Um, the role of the word no. Um, 
No is a word that I would encourage you to avoid when, when, when negotiating with them. There are ways to say no. There are ways to, to convey uh, your inability to do something. But I would encourage you to try to find ways to defer as opposed to actually flat out rejecting. Um, I put some phrases up on the screen there for you to, um, to you look at. But you can see the phraseology um, basically delivers the same message. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to soften the, the message in the negotiation. You know, do you understand? That's sort of a one-way question implying there's something wrong with, with the receiver of the message as opposed to are we being clear? Or do we, in other words, we're making it joint. Um, um, we can't do that. Might be better said, that might be difficult for us to do. And shifting um, um, the responsibility is a, a, a pretty common thing in, um, in saying no. Uh, what, I forget the name of the writer. Someone once wrote and said, um, to be truly powerful in China is to be able to avoid responsibility for your decisions. That what, that what you need to do is be able to, to shift it off on something else while at the same time um, indicating and um, defending um, your position. Uh, Graham and Lamb, two Harvard uh, professors back in October of uh, 2003, um, did a fairly exhaustive study called the Chinese Negotiation, Harvard Business Review. Um, in it, they talked about the, um, the characteristics of um, the American negotiator and the Chinese negotiator. This was building on the, uh, the work of guys like Jeswald Salak, who's at Harvard, who studied the international negotiation process. But think about the characteristics which tend to to uh, be common for most Americans. And maybe you can see where there is the potential for confusion when dealing with a Chinese negotiator, the individual versus the collective. One of the, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Americans tend to do in trying to get to a quick deal, we have a psychology that says the fewer people on the negotiating team um, the better. There's less confusion. We can get this thing done in a hurry. Um, the problem with that is, however, that that doesn't indicate gravitas. In other words, it doesn't indicate that, that we're placing significant um, uh, significance on the negotiation by not matching the size of the, uh, the Chinese team. Um, we tend not to think in a collective mindset. Um, the hierarchical um, uh, mindset of the Chinese from the old Confucian system, that there are roles. Um, um, one of the things I always tell my students at Berkeley is at least over in China, gray hair can be a, uh, a, a, of a benefit, that there's a hierarchy. And um, it isn't always uh, necessarily a competence which determines who will be running the negotiating team, who will be necessarily be making the decisions. We, we are an information-oriented society. They are a relationship-oriented. Um, we think very linear. We take like a funnel. If you, I don't know how it works here. Well, you guys are notorious for thinking outside the box. But, but thinking linearly, bringing things down and diluting them to the main point, as opposed to looking at the whole the whole of the, of the topic. Um, Americans, I don't know about you, but Americans, when polled, will say over and over they hate to negotiate. That most of them find a negotiation an argument, a fight, makes them uncomfortable. Yet China is definitely what we would call a haggling culture. It's expected. It's expected that there will be a back and forth. Uh, it's expected that you'll push and expect to get pushed back. In fact, um, if you don't push, push back, the Chinese call it tremble and obey. And tremble and obey is not something that I would, would advocate. Um, time is money. Time is money. Let's get this thing done. Let's hurry. 
The Chinese focus on getting to know you, to understand you. But here's the problem with the American approach, time is money. Uh, I don't disagree with the concept at all. However, the time spent putting back together a bad deal probably far exceeds the time um, uh, that you'd spend in putting it together correctly in the, um, in the first place. If you are being sent uh, by uh, Google um, to negotiate something and you're being pressured to do it in a hurry, um, perhaps you want to lose your airplane ticket. Um, it's not something that I'd suggest you do. You're not going to come to a fast resolution. Or if you do, um, there, will be, uh, there will be serious problems with it. Um, the negotiation process tends to be very informal with the Americans, as opposed to a structured formal process um, with the Chinese. The role of intermediaries, this goes back to Guanxi. In other words, if I want to get to somebody in China, if I want to get a decision, I want to get to the right person, it's usually best if I use an intermediary who has that balance sheet relationship with the person I'm trying to get to. Now, what would I advocate to um, a company like Google? Uh, if you're contemplating a negotiation, uh, you definitely want to build up the Guanxi and the relationships well in advance of the trip over there because you won't be able to build it on the initial trip. Um, one of, the, one of the things that companies uh, need to understand is that it's important in a significant negotiation to bring the big dogs out. In other words, to have a significant player show up to indicate the importance of the negotiation. Yet the negotiation itself will not occur with that person. In other words, they will withdraw and the negotiation will begin at a, at a, lower, um, a lower level. Um, what is non-existent in China is the concept of a cold call. It just is just not going to uh, to work. I made the comment about uh, to be truly responsible is to be able to avoid responsibility, for uh, to be truly powerful is to be able to avoid responsibility. Uh, limited authority plays a big role with most negotiators, which goes back to the collective. Um, you're not going to normally find someone on the spot who is able to make a decision right, uh, right then and there. Most American negotiators tend to have significant more authority when they're dispatched to a negotiation. And um, um, this, I guess what I'm telling you is pack a big suitcase and plan to be there a while. Um, don't, as someone said the other day, uh, did you get a multiple visa or a single trip visa? And I laughed because a single trip visa is a complete waste of money. I mean, get a, get a multiple trip visa and plan on multiple trips because that's what's going to, uh, uh, going to happen. Um, Americans uh, tend to make proposals up front in a hurry. Let's cut to the hunt. Um, the uh, Chinese, the tactic they use is to often uh, talk about the goals and the principles of the negotiation. Have you buy into the goals and principles and then turn the table on you and say, so why aren't you willing to agree? You bought into the principles and we've given you the roadmap to accomplish those principles and goals. Um, let's, um, uh, uh, let's negotiate from that point. Um, Americans tend to be aggressive. By aggressive, I mean lots of proposals on the table. Let's put them out. Let's cut to the hunt. Um, the Chinese are much better listeners. And what they're really listening for is they're listening for what, um, what interests you and then to um, uh, see if they can take those interests and, and use, them, um, use them against you. Um, enduring versus impatient. And... Um, it's, it's, it's literally a form of Chinese water torture. I mean, it just, it is a long, long process. But 25% of the world's population, it's a market that no one can afford to avoid. And they take a fairly aggressive approach to negotiation. And this, this proverb probably sums it up very, uh, uh, very well. Um, they're, um, um, they're very capable of, of uh, 
demanding of you something which is completely unacceptable, uh, completely detrimental to your position, uh, probably asking that to see if you're dumb enough to go along. It's sort of an intelligence test. Um, it's very common in a negotiation to get an outrageous demand at the start and have that outrageous demand uh, immediately backed away from as the, um, as, as the uh, discussion continues. Um, the, um, uh, the tactics that you can expect are, um, uh, for an American would be openness and honesty, strength, you know, confidence, efficiency. These are kind of the hallmarks of the, uh, the American negotiator. Um, the Chinese, focusing more on face, respect, flexibility, patience, Again, back to this enduring, this enduring approach to a negotiation. Um, they're prepared to fight for what they, uh, they believe in. What I would suggest before you start to fight is to see if you can come up with a, a fair deal, a fair deal. And one of the tactics we teach in negotiation is called framing. And framing, in other words, put, taking a picture and putting a nice frame around it. Um, um, the glass is half full as opposed to half empty. The primary frame you want to use in negotiating with the Chinese is framing that it's good for China. Um, quick deals, uh, definitely to be avoided. Uh, um, the Chinese are masters at using your exhaustion. Um, feeding you and well, essentially whining and dining you into fatigue and then negotiating with you. Um, uh, I look out in this room and everybody's significantly younger than me, but I, I made the comment to my wife the other day, you know, having been back for five days, I'm not shaking the jet lag quite as fast as I used to do. To fly over there, arrive on a Monday afternoon, to go into a negotiation on Tuesday, especially in the afternoon of Tuesday, is probably not the smartest move that you can make if it's a significant negotiation. Um, the Chinese love to host you. They get you on their turf. Once they're on, on, you're on their turf, that way they can control these, um, these events. The, uh, like I say, the food and fatigue round. And um, so you need to be aware that that is uh, one of the tactics. Um, another tactic that they'll use they want you to feel like you need them more than they need you. Uh, you'll hear continually, look how big we are, look at the size of the market. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you. And I go back to the slide I showed you before about the chicken and the pig. You know, you're the pig, you bring the bacon. Uh, are you really willing to give everything up for the uh, opportunity uh, to do business with them? Um, you should be honored to do work in China. This is, this is a real opportunity. You should be honored. Um, one of the tactics that they'll use is the citing of regulations. We're unable to do that. There are regulations. There's rules. We have, we have restrictions on what we can do and what we could not do. I, I urge you to very seriously check as to whether or not that is the, uh, that is the case. I'm not going to say that they're, uh, they're lying to you, but it's very common that they're, they're bluffing or, or shading uh, the truth. The issue of trust. I would caution you never to give too much trust initially, but that's probably true in any negotiation. That may be disheartening to some of you, but I don't trust anybody at the onset. Trust is something that you need to earn. But certainly, trust is an issue uh, when negotiating overseas because uh, are you really sure of, of, of what they're saying, of what they mean? Do you really, really know them? Contracts. Contracts guarantee nothing. We will find a way to break the contract. I mean, I've got to emphasize that again. Contracts essentially mean nothing. We will change them. We will break them. We will shift them in the interest of Chinese interest. Be ready for it. 
be prepared for it and certainly don't be expected when it occurs. China is a survival culture. Survival culture. Win-win is not the norm. This is a very different negotiation approach than, say, the Japanese. I, I, I said before that stereotypes tend to be um, uh, something very dangerous to uh, place your, your confidence in. Uh, a recent study by uh, uh, the Harvard Law School on the negotiating tactics of the Japanese showed that 99% of the Japanese respondents said that win-win was the goal of a negotiation. 99%, that's a pretty good stereotype. But I can tell you this, it's not the same thing in negotiating in, uh, in China. Without a fight, you don't know each other. Expect the dust up at the start. Expect many of the meetings to end on a negative tone. This will not, this does not look good. Um, things do not bode well. Your competitors have given us a much better offer or things are looking much better for them. What they want to do is to size you up. One of the reasons, by the way, that they'd like you to come to China, that they like to control the game, is because they're going to play you off against their other, uh, their other competitors. My point, don't get disheartened. You're going to have to understand that this is their tactic and why they're doing it and use it to your advantage. Endure, be patient. Okay, tips for success. Bill Guanji, find the right people. Now, I just can't overemphasize this. You've got to find the right people with the right contacts. And you need to, to, to be able to call in those, those markers, if you will. Um, as important as finding the right people um, is to make sure that whatever you're offering them, whatever you're negotiating with them, is um, legitimate in support of the Chinese society, Chinese business, the, the concept of corporate uh, China. Bring your big dogs. Bring, bring the significant players first. But then get the significant players off stage. The negotiation initially will not be done by them. Again, I'm going to take you right back to what I said about 15 minutes ago. To be truly powerful is to be able to avoid responsibility. The decision will be made, but it will be made probably by someone who is not, um, not in the room. Beware of home court advantage. Uh, uh, the food, the drink. Um, you've come all this way. You don't want to go back empty handed. Blah, blah, blah. All of these lines will be laid on you. You do want to go back empty handed if you believe that the deal you're being offered is one which places you in a worse position than when you started before. Um, be careful of your love of talking. Uh, the Chinese love to listen. They love to make you talk. The more you talk, the more they find out. If you're going to want to talk and make your points, and obviously you have to, you need to initiate an exchange of information. Americans tend to engage in a monologue. They love to talk. They love to be listened to. Um, they're going to want you, as I said, to agree on the principles or the goals. And that's certainly something which is important in any negotiation. Where do we want to end up? Just be careful that when you agree to the goals or the principles, that you don't fall susceptible to them turning around and saying, well, you agreed to the principles. Here's how we'll get to it, fait accompli. You don't want to have that happen. Prepare for the long wait. Endure. You know, this isn't about the Chinese, it's about the Vietnamese, but one of my favorite stories I use in class is uh, in, from Kissinger's book about the negotiations at the end of the Vietnam War. But, it, but it, it sort of tells you something about the whole mentality that when Kissinger and the American delegation arrived in Paris 
in the early 70s. They took a couple floors in, uh, I believe it was the George Sank, one of the great hotels in Paris for the entire American delegation. When the North Vietnamese delegation arrived, they purchased a chateau. And the message Kissinger said wasn't lost on him. They were here for the long haul. And we, as a typical American, were here for a quick, um, a quick fix. Check the caliber of the people at the negotiation. Do they have the right people there? People who are uh, at the appropriate levels, and do they match up with you? And by the way, um, I, I'm sure I don't have to say this in politically correct Silicon Valley, but it behooves you for sure to have at least one woman in the negotiating team. If there's two people, one, I mean, I, certainly competence is the most important thing in a negotiator, but women are much better readers of high context, nonverbal messages. And you definitely want to have the right person on the team. Um, you're going to discover that um, when you're sent over, you have fairly clear lines of responsibility. At least I hope you do. What you're going to discover over there that lines of responsibility are completely blurred. Completely blurred. Uh, as I said, the decision's probably going to come from someone else outside the room. Um, the concept of compromise. Um, Compromise to most Chinese negotiators has a negative connotation. In other words, we're, again, back to the survival culture. We're here, we're here to win. Um, another tactic that they'll use, they will cite um, their problems. They'll cite why they need a particular concession from you. And uh, what they're attempting to do is to get you to buy into it and to agree. Don't buy into it. Um, they distrust fast talkers. If you've got someone particularly slick on your team, you know, send them somewhere else. Send them to Hong Kong or something. Don't take them into China. They distrust fast talkers. Patience. Um, when you have to say no, the goal is to limit the damage. You want to minimize your no's. You want to minimize rejection. Just what if, let's consider, let's defer, drag the thing out. Um, one of the first things in a negotiating class will ask the students is, why do you negotiate? And the answer is you negotiate because you need the other side. You wouldn't negotiate it if you didn't need them. You'd take it. Well, if they're sitting there with you, I encourage you to remember that. As long as they're talking to you, they need you. And if you keep talking to them, you will probably come to solution. You'll be able to get something worked out. <clears throat> Control your emotion. Um, it, it, is, it is detrimental to any negotiation to lose your cool. Uh, but avoid not just losing your cool, avoid the sort of manic depressive highs and lows which come with jet lag and fatigue, by the way, that, that we're going to lose everything, that it's slipping through our hands. Just take a break, hit the gym, get a night's sleep, and come back. Uh, number, number 11 up is very important. Increase your importance. In other words, anything you can do prior to a negotiation to increase the, the gravitas of either you or the other members of your negotiating team that can be communicated to the other side is to your advantage. It's to your advantage. And last but not least, be yourself. You're not Chinese in most cases. You, you, you need to be able to, to Understand why they're doing what they're doing, not fall susceptible to those traps, but you still have to be who you are in, in the negotiation. Uh, again, I refer you, I refer you to uh, uh, the, the Harvard study from October 2003, which will explain a little bit of the, the philosophy. But I think that the most important thing that I could recommend to American companies, and it's something which is being done more and more, is that you spend some time on the process of training your negotiating team. In other words, your team needs not just to be trained on the content 
of what you're trying to sell, of what you're trying to convey, but on the process. How are we going to do this? How will the team be constructed? Who will have responsibility for what? How will we, how will we handle the various curves and fastballs that are being thrown at us by the other side? Um, you need to either coach yourself internally or get coaching. And I think you'll find that the, uh, the results will be very, very positive. So um, why don't we take about five or 10 minutes. If you have questions, I'll try to answer them. If, uh, yes. Um, you mentioned that the Chinese negotiators are going to tend to look at a contract as something that's a little more fluid than an American negotiator will tend to. And that over time, there may be a, may come to a time when they want to revise terms in the agreement and expect that that is going to be uh, uh, something that can be done. Uh, does that work the other way as well then? You know, when you know, an American is negotiating an agreement with a, a Chinese party, should the American uh, company expect to be able to similarly uh, renegotiate more readily than one would with an American company? So, so the question was that, that if the Chinese approach a uh, conclusion or a conclusion with hyphens of a deal, with a, a contract that they might um, feel the ability to open that up again for discussion. Uh, should the American who tends to play more, place more faith in a contract uh, feel that they can do that as well, open it up if they see it to their disadvantage? And, and the answer is uh, yes, you should feel um, capable of doing it, of attempting to do it. On the other hand, understand that the Chinese have heard this same lecture from someone else in reverse, and they know that you place great faith in the contract. So if they're probably going to hammer back at you and say, but you signed the deal, if they see the deal is to their advantage and try to oppose it. Um, normally what you would do would be you would go to the quote, right people, unquote, and get that right person over there to speak to the person with the authority to open the deal up and open it up that way rather than a, a formal renegotiation. It's all about connections. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Do you find similar um, space or countries and agents around the country? Do I find similar traits to other Asian countries? You mean similar to, to these? Um, yeah, certainly there are some. The, the, the enduring, the patience, the, the lack of a lot of, um, of um, high, high-powered emotion uh, tend to be fairly, um, fairly common. Um, the, the emphasis on relationships and connections, certainly uh, uh, very similar. Uh, but there are, very, there are very distinct differences between a... Uh, a, a, a Thai negotiator and a, a Korean negotiator. Um, uh, emphasis is placed on different things. For example, in Korea, if I was negotiating with a Korean, the first thing I'd want to find out was what university that Korean had graduated from and find the right person assisting me from the same university, because that's probably the number one door opening relationship that I could have, um, different than it would be, say, in in Thailand or, uh, or Japan. Um, there's a good book out there called, uh, it, it's, it's sort of popcorn for the brain, but it's not bad, called Kiss, Bow, and Shake Hands, which um, uh, gives you sort of a, a, an idea, uh, a preliminary idea of how uh, different countries might negotiate. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the role of the government? So if you're dealing with another uh, business organization, but there's gonna be potentially government oversight and um, you know, when you're doing things where there might be government concern around it, how does that impact how you might negotiate with the Chinese partner? The question is uh, the, the impact of government or governmental concern on negotiating with a Chinese business. Well, certainly I think your, your experience with uh, uh, Google will show you that the Chinese government is infin uh, intimately involved in most all of these uh, discussions. Things have to be done within the context of corporate, um, corporate China. Uh, you may not be negotiating with the government per se, but you're negotiating with the, with the influence of the government. Um, uh, 
businesses are allowed to enter into certain transactions to undertake certain obligations consistent with the resource allocation that the government has, um, has given them. Um, I cited the issue of regulations. Uh, the companies will constantly cite regulations. The government won't let us do that. There are prohibitions against doing that. That's not always the case, but it's very effective um, duck and cover that, the, uh, uh, that they will use. Anybody else? Yes? When you lose situation, and all those are in situation, you say good strategies to make it look like we're losing. <laughs> if their goal is win, if their goal is win lose, and ours is win win, uh, would I say that we should try to make it appear that we're losing? Um, let, let's just be a little careful here. The the. The concept of win-win has gotten a lot of play. And uh, I was just talking with Alwyn before the, uh, uh, the presentation. Win-win um, is probably the operable goal for an ongoing business relationship. You know, the, the, the ladies have all heard the nursery rhyme, you kiss a lot of frogs to find a prince. OK, we, we kiss all these frogs, we find a prince. We don't want to kill them off uh, immediately. We have to find a way to make them feel that they are not being taken advantage of. Um, that, that is not to say that in business there isn't a time for win-lose. And win-lose is based on having alternatives uh, that, that you can choose. And if you have an alternative, you, you, you go for the best deal for you, and, and you don't care. The Chinese tend to push for win-lose. There's a lot of power negotiating. Um, in any negotiation, one of the things you have to do is an expression from the old um, uh, I believe it was um, the sting, Paul Newman and Robert Redford, cool the mark. What you need to do is help them sell to their side what they agreed to, make them feel that they have come away with something, but it's got to be real. It can't be phony yeah, because they'll wake up the next morning and discover they didn't come away with something, and they'll immediately try to break the deal. You can take that to the bank. Um, but you never gloat. I mean, it's just bad. You just never gloat. And you, you never uh, 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 emphasize the one-sidedness of, of any deal. Um, you can get wool from the lamb every year, but you only can skin it once. You've got to be careful here. Any other questions? OK, well, well thank you very much. I, I uh, am watching with interest your, uh, your progress in, um, uh, in China. It's a, it's a huge market. Um, uh, marketing students drool at the prospect of China. You know, we talked about 25% of the population be living in mainland China. Try this one on. 8% of the world lives within 50 miles of the Yangtze River. So just draw your marketing density right down there. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous market and a fascinating place. And um, um, I wish Google um, um, good luck in that. And just remember, whether it's China or it's uh, Indonesia or it's Germany or wherever you happen to be going, there's going to be differences, subtle differences. And those differences can have a major impact on the outcome of the negotiation. It isn't just content. It's the uh, process. Okay, thank you.